thank you so much to Daniel and Ethan and Lillian for inviting me to do this. And I'll look forward to the next two, um, next Wednesday and the Wednesday after. So um, before I go too far, if you would like to start doing any kind of neck stretches or whatever you'd like to do to get ready while I'm telling you what I'm going to share, uh, as, you go, as I go through, I recorded some of the demos because Zoom is not terribly reliable. But I think if you want to, um, I will also play along with you. If it cuts in and out, I apologize. That's what Zoom does. Um, also, I've modified some of these exercises I've gone along. Either I've changed the key or the, um, the octave or sometimes the dynamic. So uh, I want you to know that some of these are not exactly the way they are in the books. But I wanted to highlight some that are kind of from some of our flute greats as we go along. And you'll recognize most of these names, I would assume. So let me share my screen and go to my PowerPoint and hope it all works. And while you're doing that, Ada, I just want to take a moment and remind everyone, if you have any questions, uh, please type them in the chat room and Daniel and I will be monitoring it as we go through the warm-up session today. Okay. All right, can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. So this is my contact information. If you want to take screenshots as I go along, I'd appreciate it if you didn't take a screenshot of every page and then put it together and present it somewhere. <laughs> but if you would like to, any of the exercises, um, they're not all mine, so you can certainly uh, share those. But this is my email, my website, and my students take care of the Facebook and Instagram. Um, so you can check that out as well. And then we'll go to our first page. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on physical warm-ups, so if you want to read through those, you can try a couple of those yourself. But to get kind of warmed up, Carol Winsense does this thing in her master classes, um, I've seen, where she does kind of cross-country skiing. So to get your shoulders kind of warmed up, she kind of swings her arms like this, and you kind of bend your knees. And if you do that for about 30 seconds, it's amazing how between your shoulder blades starts to really warm up. And it kind of also gets the stress level down a little bit, gets your kind of, get your breath going so that you can take some deep breaths when you're finished. Okay, some wrist exercises I'd like to share from my physical therapist is if you put your hands like so, and you slide one hand to the top of the other and stretch your wrist back, and rock back and forth from one hand to the other. Um, I have mild carpal tunnel right now, I just found out. So um, I'm doing these every day, and she said, the physical therapist said, don't stretch back too far. Just, just do a gentle back and forth. And it keeps those tendons oxygenated in, in here. Then the disco movement, um, I sometimes I'll grab like a masking tape roll or something that's about this size, and you, with both hands. Um, I didn't have two of them, so... And mostly so that you make sure you're getting full range of motion so that you're going around in circles. But if you have, if you hold this, you're sure to get really large circles. Okay. So this is again for the wrists and I'm doing these mostly because this, this is an area I have trouble with and then change directions. And my therapist said to do this for five to seven minutes. So we're not going to do that. Okay. Great. So the first exercise here for the low register, I'm sure most of you will recognize, we have um, the Trevor Y exercise. And I changed it slightly because he leaves this, um, when you go down the augmented fourth, he leaves that in eighth notes, which changed the meter. And I kind of wanted to stay in, in three, four times. So um, I have a little clip here. You probably all know this exercise, but here it goes. I wrote an outline underneath that so that if you want to play this with your students or I'm going to play it with you now so we can actually play together I won't hear you but you'll hear me I'll play the outline and so I'm going to play the CGC and then the augmented fourth outline 
What this exercise is good for is you can do all kinds of things. Flutter tongue, the long notes. You can hum the first note, which I wanted to show you. It's hard for me to sing the C this early in the morning, but I'll sing the G. So I'm going to hum and put the flute in the groove in my chin so that the curve of my head joint is right in the groove of my chin and get that grip so that it's underneath the red part of my lip. And then I'm going to hum the G without singing and playing like Catherine was doing last week. We're just going to hum. And let the flute vibrate. And then form your embouchure a little bit better and you'll get like a buzz if you can hear this. I don't know how that comes through on Zoom. And it seems to relax my embouchure and really center the air. So if you want to try that. <clears throat> Too early in the morning for a C. <clears throat> Okay, let's try the exercise. If you play the melody, I will play the outline so we can play together. So about one, two, and three, and here we go. Two, three. we can go down a half step and do that. So let's go down a half step starting on the B and I'm going to play the the outline an octave higher so I'm not in the same register as you. Here we go. One, two, three. Okay, I like to start with something melodic. I'm not, I don't like to do long tones right in the very beginning. I'm sorry. <laughs> if, that's, if that's blasphemy, I apologize. But I like to flutter tongue this. I like to hum it. I like to play it in different octaves. But something melodic just so that I'm playing music first thing in the day. Okay. Oops. Okay. How many of you know this Sam Barron exercise? Um, yeah, I think this is such a good exercise. Um, so it's low for the low register. It was in Flute Talk actually a few years ago, and I kind of stole it. And I thought, okay, this is this is a good one. So if you'll notice, the first phrase is just like thirds. In if you want to say C major, I kind of think it sounds more like A minor. Then the second phrase, you change this third note by lowering it. Then the third phrase, you lower the second note, which is also the last note. And then you change the only note you hadn't changed yet, which is this, this one here. And so take a listen to this and listen how the tonality sounds. Okay, so give this one a try. And sometimes what I do is on the last note, I'll improvise a little something in that key. So if I get to the, that feels like A minor in that first phrase, I'll just kind of do an A minor triad or a little A minor scale. The second one might feel like D minor, F major. I might on the last note play an arpeggio. And then the third one is I think squarely A flat major. Then the last one is maybe mixolydian or whole tone. So if you want to take it upon yourselves to improvise around this, let's try it. And I'm going to play up an octave and I'm going to flutter the note um, that changes in each phrase. Okay, let's try this. Really full sound between the notes. Okay, 
That's another Mariano thing. If I heard it once, I heard it a thousand times. Fill the spaces. Okay? So, legato. Here we go. Three. Sorry. Ready? Sorry again. Good, to get to the next key, it's magical. You change the first note, okay? So you lower the first note and you get to B. Name these in their enharmonic spellings and now you're down into B major or if you wanna see this as G sharp minor. You change the third note, then the second note, which is the last one as well, and then this fourth note, then you lower the top note and you're in B flat. It's magic. So again, flutter tonguing anything that makes your tone really full, sometimes with and without vibrato on every other note or just vibrato on the last note, whatever. Okay, any questions on that one? Okay. Oops, sorry. In here. Okay, I think we all know this also. Um, when I say modified here, it's because Trevor uh, starts, Mr. Y, sorry, starts this on A minor. I like starting on G, I feel like it's sort of the middle of the flute, like all my fingers are kind of holding the instrument. So um, on this one, I circled the kind of outline notes because it's always important to think of what the outline is. And um, Patricia, is, uh, George is into this, uh, as we all should be. So we're gonna, I'm going to play just the outline notes. And if you just wanna do long tones right now, you can play that with me. And when you get to this measure, just hold the G. It'll harmonize with this whole thing, and then back to the D, okay? So, um, and then at the bottom, I wrote out a little, oops, sorry. I wrote out a little harmonization to this. So I'm gonna play the harmony while you guys play the melody. And I made this up um, just before the NFA thing. I thought, well, there must be a way to make this a duet. So I will play the, the harmony, and you can play the melody again. Take a good breath. This is a good one for breathing, as this third phrase takes takes a big breath to get all the way through this, the tempo we're at. Again, fill the spaces. I will pass that along from uh, Mr. Mariano to you. Okay. Okay, so about one, two, and three, and one, and I'll play the harmony. One, two, So if you want to steal that and play it with your students, go ahead and take a screenshot of that. You can play it in every key. Okay, that was for the getting into the middle register. Um, this is the Kincaid vocalist. Hopefully all of us know who William Kincaid was. He was kind of the grandfather of American flute playing. And he was Marianne, Mr. Mariano's teacher who I studied with at Eastman. But he studied with George Barrer, so this all goes back to the Paris Conservatory. I read a, a dissertation just recently, it was written back like in 2002, that something like 90% of American flutists can trace themselves back to, um, to Barrer, so, and through Kincaid mostly. So he taught at the, um, at the Curtis Institute for about 40 years. He played in the... Um, Philadelphia Orchestra, of course, from 1921 to 1960, which is unbelievable. So um, I had a chance when I was, I think it was when I was Pat's student, actually, to take a lesson with him. And um, I was going to go from Rochester, New York to Philadelphia, and I was pretty young and too afraid to do that, and I didn't do it, and he died the next year. I felt so bad. So never pass an opportunity. <laughs> so this exercise is a dominant seventh exercise, and if you're going up 
starting on G, you're going to do a flatted seventh, and then the regular seventh, or the sharp seven, and then come down dominant seventh. So that sounds like this, and I'll play it in both keys. Good. So give this one a try and stretch up and over the top so that you're really thinking of that little chromaticism at the top and coming down the dominant seventh. And I I'm going to play up an octave so that I'm not playing in the same octave as you. I'll just do the G major one with you and then let you go on the A flat one. Here we go. So really smooth connection between the notes. Taper the last note for as long as you can. Try to hit it maybe at a mezzo forte at least and see if you can last for a while to taper the last note and work on getting your lips to come forward and taper that lovely last note. One, two, three, Okay, I must say this is my go-to, I think this is usually the first thing I play in the day. And I've probably known this since I was in high school. So I, I don't know, it's just a nice gentle exercise. It gets the air moving. Uh, I'm sorry, click in. Okay, now I've combined a couple of exercises. We all know Marcel Moise, of course, and uh, the long tones from De La Sonorité. And I modified this just to get them into whole notes because I wanted to line them up with this Paul Edmund Davies exercise. If you don't have the Paul Edmund Davies book, I think it's good. It's The first section is called Sonority, then I think it's called, the technique ones are called Fingers, and then art, Articulation, and then Intervals, I believe. Is that right? And there's about seven exercises in each category. So this one, he actually starts it on B flat, so I wanted to start it on B so we could do it with the long tones. So. If you play this, if it was a piece of music, go through the long tones and then go through the melody, I'm going to do just the opposite. So I'm playing um, the melody while you're playing the long tones. And you can see that all this is, this me melody that he made up here, is, starts on the B, second measures the A sharp, the B going to the A sharp again. So, and it does have these dynamics. So if you want to do your long tones with these dynamics, that's fine. And I mentioned a fingering thing that um, my former student, Daniel Pardo, said, you never told me that one, so I will tell you this one now. Um, when you're going from B to A sharp or B flat to A, whatever, if you think while you're doing these for this smooth transition, the whole idea of these long tones is matching your tone quality from one note to the next. Is if you think about, I like using my side key for the A sharp, is just bringing the flute up to kind of meet your finger. So instead of like pushing the finger down and getting maybe a clunk between the notes, if you kind of lift your flute and think about that finger meeting your um, the A sharp key. So if you can. Didn't mean to get a glitch there, but. And when you do B flat to A, have your finger kind of hovered above the A key and just bring your flute up to meet it, okay? It creates a really nice um, liaison between the notes, okay? I'm gonna play the melody first and then the long tones, but you play it this way and we'll stop here, okay? So about two, three, four.
Okay, I don't get the benefit of hearing that with somebody else, so I hope that that was a nice duet for you to... Oops, sorry. Stop with that one. Okay. All right, and we can do it in the other key, but in the interest of time, I will move on. It sounds Four really minutes. good here at Burkhardt because I can hear you play and Daniel is actually warming up in the testing room. <laughs> oh, you can hear both of us. Cool. Yeah. I wish I could get uh, the full effect here. So harmonics. I mean, I could write pages on harmonics, of course. And I must say, uh, I'm going to show you something from Patricia George's book. But harmonics, you'll find in pretty much every warm-up book. Um, there's so many ways to do these. I'm not particularly fond of doing... Uh, more than the first three partials at first. It's, it's too much on my embouchure. So I like just doing the fundamental and the next two overtones. So I'm like, we're going to, in the interest of time, how am I doing here? Yeah. That we can start on F instead of down here on D. And let's, if you need to tongue these individually first, you can try the... separate them just to kind of try to find them and then maybe try them slurred okay I'm going to stop playing when we get to about the B one because the intonation will be you know get in each other's way so I'll do it with you but keep going all the way to the end and if the C sharp one feels a little out of your range before you're well warmed up then leave that one out for now but down here don't forget when you do A sharp you can't do the one and one fingering because the harmonic won't work so either your side key or your B flat thumb. Okay, so let's start on F. Go do about. Okay, well, tell I'm not warmed up. Here we go. Two, three, and. Okay? Yeah, and do them however you like. Sometimes I'll do the fundamental, the octave, go back down to the fundamental, and then try to skip up to the fifth and back down. There's all kinds of ways. But I want to make sure that we try left-hand scales. So um, Patricia George has this in her book, the flute scale book, A Path to Artistry. And it's really interesting that you can play, of course, that G major scale with just your left hand. So if you see these fragments, you can play, um, let me move this a second. So you can play, oh, you guys jumped up to the top of my screen. That's bizarre. Okay. Okay. Um, if you finger G, A, B, C, then finger G, A, B, C again, you'll get the next partial. And one thing um, that we can try is holding your flute where the name of your flute is, the barrel, come, your right hand coming in from the back of your flute. Okay, and this works actually better if you don't have your foot joint on, but for now we'll do this. And this was not my idea, this is Pat's idea. So um, we're going to do and then overblow, come down, give that a try. Okay, now we're going to go all the way up. And keep the air moving. The whole idea of this is getting the air to flow. So you're not really thinking about so much your embouchure adjustment. You're just getting the air to flow. So we'll go all up. And again. Okay. Sorry. All right. And now we're going to put it together. 
okay? And the whole idea is not to get too tight, right? Just to play this with a, a nice flow and going up and down a couple of times. So. Whenever I've done this with my students, it just, they feel when they go back to their real fingerings, it feels more effortless. So that they're just using the air and not thinking so much about tightening the embouchure. Okay, try that a couple times up and down. Da, 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 here we go. You can also do it on A flat. Okay, so you just finger A flat, B flat, C, D flat, and come back down. Okay, so try it on A flat, try it slowly first, maybe. Because you have to remember to go back to your, your regular D flat fingering here. Okay, so give it a try. You can also do it on A, but I think these two are really good. And then if you go now and try one of either a G scale or an A flat scale with the real fingerings, go ahead and try that. Do it with the harmonic fingering, then go back and just take a breath and do it with the real fingerings. It's so funny to watch everybody playing and not hear a thing. <laughs> it's just so weird. So this idea, I think, for especially for beginners, is such a good idea because you're going to get that marriage, uh, you know, the spoons here where you, you get the curve of your lip plate in the curve of your chin, and it gives you a little bit of stability. Okay. All right. So Theobald Bain. I'm assuming we all know who that was, but <laughs> Theobald Bain was the inventor of the kind of the key system for the, for the flute in the mid-1800s. So I was teaching in Bulgaria um, in 2015, 16, and 18, because our clarinet teacher here at um, Texas State is from Bulgaria, and he invited me to go teach uh, master classes there. It was really amazing. Um, so the students were warming up on this exercise, and I thought, wow, I need to learn that. So they were teaching us that. And just this summer, I was... I wanted to include it in this, and I was talking to a former student, uh, Danny Stevens Nutting, who is another Burkhart person, um, and she said, oh, Dr. Jones, that's that's from Theobald Bain 12 Etudes, and I was like, wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> so this is slightly modified. He does it in triplets and kind of in different octaves than I've written it here. So this is a great exercise for getting your triads and your chords under your fingers. So I'm going to go up a major triad down a dominant seventh. I don't usually do this with my freshmen because they haven't had enough theory stuff to understand all of these chords. Then the minor triad, then coming down the diminished seventh in that key, so B diminished, B, D, F, A flat. Then make the C the root and make that a dominant seventh chord and coming back down so you resolve to the next key. So they sound like this. <laughs> Okay, I did that in chunks for a reason, okay? So you have time to think in the rests what the next chord's gonna be, okay? So I'm gonna play the outline of the chords. I'm just gonna play the root of each of these chords while you try the written part. You don't have to do it that fast. I'll do it a little slower, like do, 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 rest, two, three, do, 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 nice and legato, and think what chord you're gonna play next. Okay, let's try it together and I'll play the outline. One, and two, Rest and And now you're in the next key. So, uh, sorry. 
All right, so now we're gonna chunk it in two beat patterns. So we're gonna go up and down the dominant seventh, up the minor chord, down the diminished seventh, Oh, sorry, I didn't mute. I, I'm sorry if you got an echo then. Okay, so now I'll play the outline of the chords and you try this up and down major triad, dominant seventh, minor triad, diminished seventh, dominant seventh, resolve to the next key. Here we go. Dun, da, 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 da. It's a good one. I really like this exercise. Okay, let's see if we can put it together. Okay, so I wrote it out in C and then we'll stop there and we'll see if we have time to go on to F. Okay. Probably not. Okay, so we're going to go up and down and do it continuous. And I'll play the outline. Here we go. Ready? And. And then, of course, you can do it in F. It's nice, and you just keep going around the circle of fifths. Okay, great. All right, double tonguing. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip this first page because I don't think there's anybody on here that needs to do too much chunking on this, but I chunked it because I find that when I ask students what they think their problem is with double tonguing, nine times out of 10, they, they say, I can't get my fingers and tongue lined up. And I think eight times out of 10, it's usually their fingers that are the problem and not their tongue, okay? Because they'll play a scale and it'll come out like And if it's uneven like that, it's not gonna, it's not gonna go together, okay? So I want to incorporate slurring um, these patterns and then going back and tonguing them because if you can slur them and hear where your bumps are and get rid of those bumps and then tongue it, okay? So I've got embedded all these little things, so I'll play them real quick. This is the evenness. Okay, so the end result of taking that apart like that is this exercise, is double tonguing, getting your tongue really even, then slurring the scale so you're sure your fingers are even, double tongue tonic again, first note of the scale, then get a running start and double tongue the scale. So hopefully it sounds like this. Oops. Okay, give that a try. And what I'm going to do when I play with you, I'm going to play up a third so we're not playing on the same notes. Okay, so this is a good double tongue exercise. Don't forget to listen for the bumps on your slurred one. Here we go. A little slower than that. Dugga, 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 dugga. Hopefully that worked. Let's try again. One, two, one. Good. I usually do that one starting on low G, and then I do A flat and then A, and I just work my way up. Lately, I've been actually trying to do it in harmonic minor instead of in the majors, and that's been a real challenge. Okay, and one more, and then 
out of here. Okay, this I did not do for the NFA one um, because I, uh, I mentioned it and then some people wrote to me and wanted to get it. So here it is. If any of you know who Maurice Sharp was, he played in the Cleveland Orchestra for about 30 years and taught at the Cleveland Institute. And he's another Kincaid student. So um, as you do this one, it starts out like the Kincaid exercise where we did the that C, the flat and then the natural. Then it does this turnaround where each pattern is the first note of a, as the outlines a dominant seventh chord coming down with these little turnarounds. So the turnarounds in chunks are So it's down, a, it's a little tricky to learn this one, but it's down a half step, then up to a scale tone. So it's C, B flat, G, E, then you do it for another octave. Then you do the same thing you did in the first measure. Then you come down that dominant seventh chord, resolve to F and play a nice little triad. So. So, took me a while to learn that one. I learned it from Jean Robinson, who's second flute in the San Antonio Symphony. She was warming up on this. So give it a try on your own. I'll stay out of your way. Play it slowly and think about how the dominant seventh is working on the way down. Okay, I think it's a great one and um, several of my students are learning this one right now. So um, I have it all written out for them, but I like to try to see if they can learn it by ear first <laughs> instead of just playing it from the music. But there are advantages to doing it from the music as well. So you just get your fingers going. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to the next page, if I can get there. Okay. So I listed a bunch of um, books that I have mentioned, but also some other ones that you can get. And Kathy had uh, last week had so many different ones than what's on this list. So I'm hoping maybe um, we can all com we compile all these. Um, I'd like to buy some of the ones she mentioned. Um, the Robert Stallman book last week. I don't own that, so I would need to get that. So if you'd like to take a picture of that, you're welcome to it. Several of these are are on IMSLP. Believe it or not, the Tavnal Gobert is on IMSLP, which saves you a bundle. But if you want to print it out, it'll take you forever. So, um, so that's a list of books we used. And then here's a list of the flutists that we talked about today. Carol Winsens, we uh, are international artist who teaches at Juilliard and, and Stony Brook. Marcel Moise, uh, of course, he lived in um, Vermont for many years. I was lucky enough to go to a master class with him. Trevor Y. Was a, um, a student of Jeffrey Gilbert, who is a British flutist um, who studied with Rene Lebois um, and learned the French style of playing and brought it to, to England. Um, Sam Barron, student of Barrere, and he also taught at Stony Brook. William Kincaid, Paul Edmund Davies was a student of Trevor Wise. He was principal flute of the London Symphony. Then our lovely lady that's with us today, Pat George, Jeffrey Gilbert, uh, Theobald Bain, Maurice Sharp, and of course, this last strange person at the bottom there. Um, <laughs> and I had, I, I would say, four of the most wonderful teachers ever. So I was a pretty lucky lady. So those are the flutists that I mentioned today, and that we have such a wonderful lineage and link to these people that basically goes back to the Paris Conservatory, all the way back to Duvienne, and before that, back to Blavet. So I hope I passed along some information about all of that.